joined us via LinkedIn or YouTube or your favorite podcast. And so we welcome you to the show. I welcome you to certainly watch and, and go back and listen to any of the previous shows we've done, any of the previous books that we've covered. Today's a special episode because it is the last episode for the season, but also because we've got some really great guests on the show. We have Dan Reardon, uh, VP from Capgemini, and we have Anthony Prasad, a senior solutions architect over at Amazon. Uh, both are great friends uh, and both are brilliant when it comes to talking about data architectures and talking about data products. And that's the topic today is data products. We want to get into it from a couple of different lenses. Uh, we want to talk about, first of all, understand what we think it is. And I think you ask 10 people, you may get 10 different definitions. So I'm really curious to see how each of the participants in the call today would define data mesh um, and data products, actually more, more specifically. Um, but I also want to talk about what the impact is. I think sometimes we, we get caught up in talking about what it is and really what really matters is what it does. And so there's a lot of different ways to apply data products. And so we may get into some really interesting topics there. And so I'm ready to jump right into it. We have a whole hour to go. Feels like a lot, but it always goes by really, really quick. And so without any further delay, welcome to the show, Anthony. Welcome to the show, Dan. And of course, my colleague, welcome to the show, Andy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Dan, I like your picture. I, I like. I, I'm looking at our four pictures here, and and you're you're pointing at something. It, it's like you're calling. Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm basically trying to get out of the matrix. <laughs> you're saying don't take yeah. the picture yet. So, Click. <laughs> yeah, let, let me out. Let me out of this uh, this world. Uh, no, yeah. So yeah, I might have to change that picture. You know. So ah, I love um, it. I love yeah. it. Hey, yeah. So let's let's start off. Um, with the definition uh, of a data product. And I, and I don't want, hopefully, I don't think any one of us is going to do this, but I think most of the audience would have probably picked up an article or, or read a book and gotten the academic version of it, which is fantastic. Great place to start. I'm really interested in trying to understand from you uh, a more practical definition. When you're sitting in front of your customers, you're sitting in front of somebody who's really wants to understand in, in terms that they can grasp what it is, what do you say? And and Dan, I hope you don't mind. I'll, I'll start with you. Okay, yeah, yeah. So um, and maybe this is controversial, Adrian, right? But I'm yeah. beginning to maybe remove a little bit of the data mesh language yeah. from the conversation, yeah. right? I agree. Because um, um, data mesh really are a set of principles. But if, if we really make it very, very simple, what is a data product, right? <laughs> In the end, right? It's a data set that was prepared either through a bunch of engineers who wrote some Python code, who did ingestion, or who used a federated query to produce that data set. Now, traditionally, I think the way we have looked at data is very much being project oriented, right? You hire a bunch of data engineers. In a way, you were a little bit separated from the guys who actually knew what those original data sets were, but you hire data engineers. And data engineers, right, were trying to do the best they could. And they would literally put everything into maybe a cloud data warehouse. M more, more was always better, okay? Um, but in the end, right, a data product is a data set that has qualities in terms of who's using it. Is there a feedback loop to say um, we, we need improvements on this particular data set? Um, and, and it's really like if, if, if we were to start manufacturing, Adrian, if we were to start manufacturing a mobile phone tomorrow, we would know very, very quickly from Amazon all of the negative feedbacks, right? So introducing those elements. Um, so that for me, right, are mesh principles. But the, the core thing is, is that, that uh, reusability. So yeah. The work that the data engineers do with the domain experts how can we make that more reusable um, through what you guys are doing at, at Starburst? You know, the, that interface, that user experience you bring. So bring that user experience um, for, for me is, is what a data product is. Awesome. So there, there's an element of efficiency there in the way that they're created. Um, there's an element in just kind of reimagining that asset you started with, right? What that actual asset actually is. We talked about moving everything um, and now, Kind of trying to focus a bit more, so fantastic, Anthony. How what would your definition be? And then, and then, and feel free to say anything. I love if we can create an argument here because it becomes like a like a match, right? Feel free to throw a jab if you have to. 
No, no, absolutely. Um, hopefully not. But <laughs> um, I think I think what I'd like to say is, uh, you know, first of all, I think Dan, uh, you set the stage, uh, you know, and and I'd like to take a step back, you know, and talk about, you know, what businesses really want from the data, right? So I think we got to understand that ninety nine percent of the businesses today they want to become data driven, right? Whether you're in the healthcare industry, whether you're in the oil and gas, whether you're in the fintech, whatever industry you're in. They want to be data driven, right? Now, around 30% of them have actually been successfully able to crack the code, right? So every organization is in a different data journey. Let's put it that way, right? So to Dan's point, you know, when you define a data set, there might be a data set somewhere that might not be useful for a certain client and something that might be used for, for another client. So there's not a one size fits it all kind of data set or there's not a one size fits it all kind of methodology, right? And that's what we've noticed at AWS, right? Every customer's use case is different. The data could be structured. It could be semi-structured. It could be unstructured, right? So there's a ton of things that we need to do. And data engineering, in my opinion, is probably one of the most underrated, undervalued role in the last few years. Because when I was at Amazon.com, uh, I was pretty much the only data engineer in a team of 40 people. We had several SDEs or software developers, and you know, we were asked to build ETL pipelines. And this is a world before uh, I came to know about Starburst. So, <laughs> well, I would have simplified a lot of those processes. But again, coming back to your point, I think it's about creating a very curated, massaged, trimmed data set and making that available to our customers. I think it's not just about curating it, but also making it available for customers to easily consume. Producer right. to the consumer. Yeah. And I like the, the little bit of contrast here. You started with the consumer, right? And I think I, I really support that that idea. I often, uh, look, everyone has a different starting point. And as you said, everyone's design is gonna look a little bit different. I always tell people that I talk to, the nice thing about the, the mesh principles that Dan referred to, or the mesh concept, whether you call it a mesh or a fabric or, or a virtualization layer or a semantic layer, to me, it's all the same. The nice idea with that, that those concepts is you want to start with what you have, like, hey, what? What, what does a perfect data product look like? My answer is always like, show me what you got, right? Let's figure out what we have to work with. And then we can figure out what the right first step for you is. And before you start figuring out how to build it, let's go talk to the consumer and let's figure out what they need. Once I understand what they need and I understand what I have, then I can understand the gap, so to speak. But more importantly, I can get started right away. I can say for us, our MVP data product, it looks like this and we can run with it today and that meets their needs. And then we can grow to something else. Mr. Mott, what would you say, sir? So uh, I was listening to Andy and, and Dan, and um, <clears throat> so so I think the term project was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the I think I think uh, we haven't really touched on who um, in this conversation. So who builds data products? Uh, I'll come back to some of these in a moment, and then I guess the other piece is how we make data products work together. Um, so if I think about projects. To me, a project is something that you begin, you do, and then you end. And I think uh, we need to revisit that thinking when we think about products, because with a product, in my opinion, we, you know, we start from where we start from. We don't necessarily know where we're going to end up, but someone has to be responsible for that kind of process, right? And it, it's the pro, it's the 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 time is associated with the, I guess, the lifetime of the product and not necessarily the initiation of the product. Um, and I think that marks products apart to some degree with what we've done previously. You know, we will build a data mart, give it to some people, we've done our job, now it's up to them to do theirs. Um, and so that, that I think is an interesting thing, to, uh, an interesting aspect. I think the ownership is also interesting. Um, I was in a conference last week in Stockholm and it was really interesting about uh, ownership of data products. There's, there's two very uh, opposing schools of thought. Let's build them all in the central team like we've done previously because we can get efficiency of skills and you know, spe hyper-specialization and whatnot. And then there's the, well, let's get the business guys to do it because they kind of understand the data, et cetera. And so, I mean, there's an interesting discussion there, right? Where, where, where do we sort of, uh, where does the pendulum swing to? And then... Um, the what was the other one I was going to mention? Um, oh yeah, if I think about uh, how do we use these things together? So 
uh, and I know, I know kind of we've just said that uh, people are focusing more on data products than data mesh, but one of the things that data mesh talks about, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, is the federated computational governance. If we leave that to one side and we just think, actually, there are some concepts there that we need to think about with data products. Commonality of, you know, in the commonality of data, right? So in the, in the old world, when we had uh, Kimball data marts, we think about conformed dimensions. Right, so you know we would have one way of describing maybe an address, right? Whether it was a customer or a supplier or or something else, we'd have one one maybe one table for address, uh, and you know in in data mesh parlance that kind of starts to verge onto the the policy and concept. That thing hasn't gone away, right? So we still need to figure out how that works. Um, so I think they're they're coming up some of my uh, my my reflections. I I think I think Dan is broadly correct. Data mesh is morphing into data or focusing, maybe is the right term, is focusing on data products. I think there are then a bunch of follow on questions, which is kind of who, how that these things kind of really work from an organizational perspective. Um, I've kind of left technology a moment for a moment. Can I Very jump right. in, Andy, Ruth, Ruth, and just yeah. end, uh, Ruth? Um, is that term, federated computational governance, <laughs> am I the only person on the planet? That actually thinks it's the worst name ever, right? Was uh, was yeah. a Mac having was having a bad day, right? When she was writing that chapter, right? It just, you know, you, you say it, right? What, what does it mean, right? And, I can and tell maybe you. it's just me, and maybe I'm, I'm simple. I know, I, I know you've 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 read the book uh, about a hundred times, right? I haven't, right? But um, the, the, the yeah, I just are, are we over Are we over complicating it basically? Is what I'm saying. That that's the thing. I think we are. The word probably overcomplicates it, but I do think the concept is spot on. The idea of draw, using automation and using whether what was the word in there, sidecars or those types of things to go out there and that, drive. That, that's nonsense, by the way. That whole sidecar thing. I, sorry, I Jamak, if this, you ever watch this, I'm sorry if you ever watch this, but but that's nonsense. I, I've I've seen one work. They could they use a different they, they call them virtual engineers. Um, and I was. I was like, wow, I didn't think anybody was actually doing this. It was really impressive. Uh, it, was a, it was a bank. But let, let, me, let me come back to, to data products for a second in the definition because I want to move on to the next part. But each of us gave, and I, I love what we did, right? We, everyone gave a, a very non-book uh, view, which is awesome, except for Andy. Went back to computational, federated, federated computational governance. Uh, nothing wrong with it, Andy. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, but I, want to, I do want to kind of close up this part of the conversation with just, just a couple of, like, fundamentals, right? And I, and I think it's important when you think of data products, which you heard, it's, it is about efficiency. It's about moving from project thinking to maybe more agile DevOps thinking because they're continuously improving. Um, as Anthony said, I think we want to think about that customer and the consumer. And then Andy brought in the other pieces around the who and, and boy, well, maybe we'll come back to the who in a second because I do think who builds them and who owns them and how you maintain them is super important. But Fundamentals, if I could add a couple more pieces to that, I think reusability is something we said that's super important. I, I was asked a question recently, say, if I build a data product and it's just for one consumer, is it a data product? Yeah, that's your design, right? Now, if you want to exploit the value of data products, sharing them is really what you want to try to do. But there's nothing wrong with just building one thing for someone. It's creating value for that person. But sharing is, is multiplying that value. The other piece I think when you think about data products is if I build a data product and it comes from one source, is it as, as valuable as a data product that comes from multiple sources? Yeah, it depends on what your company's building, right? I uh, know a, uh, a big company that builds all their data products from a single lake and they love it, right? 100 data products, one lake. Uh, and I know a lot of companies that build data products from multiple different sources, on-prem, in the cloud, multiple clouds, so to speak. And so it, it's your design. I if you ask me my opinion, I would say I think the data products that cut across at Federate are the most valuable because that's the hardest data to get to. Uh, but data products from a single source are also valuable. The other piece that I think is really important to understand when we talk about fundamentals is access and security. It's really, really important when you start to design. I would say I have a, a four by four matrix design uh, variables for data products. It doesn't mean that you look at all 16 elements, but it doesn't mean that you should think about all 16 elements and say whether it's important. And one of the ones that we never skip is security. Uh, every data product needs to have a security wrapper. You want to make sure that you can define who is accessing it and if you can, what they're doing with it, right? Uh, and that's, that is a leap ahead for the auditors out there and the compliance teams out there. You can manage data product security in ways that you could never apply, right? And, and 
uh, with controls that you could never imagine the, the old way, right? I can't control tables, rows, fields, and columns. It's too many of them. A hundred data products. Yeah. 200. Yeah. 500. Yeah. You can manage security on those. So I think that's a, we can take a big leap from a compliance perspective. So I want to cover those elements before we move on to the next topic where I want to talk about data product impact. Let me ask the group. Is there any, any other fundamentals that are worth just mentioning real quick? I think one uh, thing that uh, probably I didn't want to talk about is data governance as well. Right. You talked about the security aspect, right? So here's where, you know, there's a conundrum between the producer and the consumer, because the producer is producing the data, you know, if there's PII information, classified information, right? You'd assume that the producer is taking care of that and ensuring that only the relevant information is shared, like you said, with the consumer. Now, when you come to a world where, let's say you take a step back and the consumer wants the raw data, right? Now, consumer doesn't want just a curated or trim data set. The consumer yeah. wants the raw data. And then they're going to figure out what they can showcase and they can consume or provide to their customers, right? So there's a two-way flow here, but it, it, it's kind of a debate where whose responsibility should it be, right? I think that's the conversation we're trying to get. Like, is it the consumer's fault or line to ensure that data is properly governed to their end users or is it the producer's responsibility? Again, it depends on the data set, right? Um, but I think data governance is something that we at AWS uh, have really strived and make, made leaps and bounds in simplifying that process, right? Uh, we came up with Lake Formation uh, quite recently, and I know we've worked with that with Starburst. And I think that's really simplified the process from one aspect. But we continue to innovate, uh, you know, and move forward. I think that's an important element that uh, everyone should uh, be mindful of. So I'll, uh, I'll just expand that a bit, if I may. I, um, this is something, this is one of my soapbox topics. I think that one way to have a scalable implementation of what you've just described, that, that kind of who's responsible for giving access to stuff. Um, I actually think that the, the, only really, the only real way that you can scale this is probably to go down an ABAC route. And what I mean by that is you tag data products or elements within data products with particular tags, right? So let's say we have an address field, we tag it with PII, right? So now that is a PII thing. For the non-security people, attribute-based access management or policy. Attri sorry, management. sorry, attribute, yeah. So, so we're, we're essentially saying this column, which has got someone's address in it or someone's name or whatever, it is, is PII sensitive, right? So we're just marking it. That's all we're doing as producers. And I think that's where as producers, to some degree, our work is done, right? We because we've said that this is a this is this is sensitive. Now, on the other side, on the consuming side, there needs to be uh, someone on the consuming side who says that these people um, in this function, line of business, marketing, finance, whatever, have access to PII data or they do not, right? So what we've done is we've said this is a thing you need to worry about as a producer. But we don't know who's going to consume our thing because you know we don't know who we're going to who's going to use it eventually. So we can't sort of say, oh, this particular role or this particular person. We've just said this is a thing that's sensitive as the producers. And I think that's where our our responsibility to some degree ends. On the other side, the consuming organization, we need to have some authority that says, you know what, Andy is uh Andy's quite frankly an idiot. And if we give him access to that address data, it's going to appear on the internet. So he can't see that, whereas you know. Adrian is more responsible, and so he can get access to that. And so now we we have kind of, I think anyway, a nice clear uh, kind of chain of responsibility in terms of who gets access to what, but more importantly, who determines who gets access to what. I, I wish. Let, let, let's then I'm going, I'm, I'm going to be the boring person, right? No, Adrian, if you if you have, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I'm going to be the boring person, right? Because. We have two technology companies, brilliant technology companies, okay? And then we have the poor plumber in the background, the boy from Capgemini. Right? Make it all work together. So, so exactly, right? Uh, and I'm the plumber, right? So um, when when we... Because Andy and I, like, we started preparing kind of a, a slide deck, basically, on what we were kind of calling data value chain, right? So... So for me, right, there was the first part, right? So 
Dealing with, with Mr. Customer, right? Of course, he there is a fear factor, right? So when he looks, he, he's read he, he's read the Zamakdagani article, right? And he says, okay, the domain, federated computational governance, he's no idea what that is. A data product he can kind of understand. Um, but the first, the, the first fear factor for Mr. Customer is, my God, we're going to employ Capgemini, right? They're going to bring in 100 consultants and they're going to map out every domain. And then from the domains, they're going to map out every potential data product and it's going to cost us a fortune, right? So, so this is why then um, I, we started working together on what we call a data product canvas. So mapping the business problem with getting the answers to the questions to say, why do you, Mr. Why do you think this uh, actual uh, data product would solve your, your business problem? Okay. And, and doing that and then doing the ideation, right? And then I look at it, right, as this uh, cycle, this pipeline, having a design authority that we're now calling the Federated Computational Governance. But, but I call it a design authority, right? How you actually, in an organization, take that pipeline of business people saying we have business problems, data products will actually help them, a combination of data products will help them solve the problem. But then you have, okay, and then you have the technology pieces, the AWS, the Starburst in the middle, that the data engineers, whatever, the domain experts are in agile, lean teams, kind of delivering on that, two-week sprints, pizza teams, like we did with microservices. But in the background, you need that feedback loop, basically saying, okay, what's not working? What's not working, for example, every organization has a platform team and they're very, very precious about their platform. They're saying, oh, my precious platform, right? So how you manage those friction points between the platform team, maybe Starburst, it's on AWS, um, they're trying to manage that. Then you have the squads delivering what I call a data product, data product factory. So, so they're in the middle, they're piggy in the middle, right? So they're trying to interact with the platform, trying to deliver on the business. And then there's that feedback that's coming into the design authority who are using things like data product canvases to do that cycle. So we've got two lovely technology companies who we're down here uh, with Mr. Customer, helping to try and reduce the fear factor, helping trying to describe that data products is the way, explain that data mesh principles really are agile and lean in terms of data factory product delivery and how we do the ideation where upfront before we develop anything we just we define what is the product and keep asking and asking and asking the questions why do you think that this data product is going to solve your problem and what are the kpis for success because if the business can't see value on a team that's actually going doing dev, test, and production, because the business are actually paying for it, right? If they actually can't see demonstrable value, which is why, why I love what Starburst did with that fact that there was kind of that feedback loop, um, you know, they, they're kind of the boring details about delivery of projects at customers, like what we've done at BMW, well, what we've done with other companies. Then I, I'm going to underscore that because I think we're like as architects or engineers, we love new things and we love to uh, over design it, right? We buy a new car. We're going to get, we start adding to it, you know, things that a brand new computer, I start buying new apps for it. So we always like to build stuff up. But I think when you start thinking about data products, uh, the most important thing, and you said it there a second ago, when you think, start thinking about the, the, the broader canvas, you start thinking about the customer and what they need. There's some easy wins, right? There's some simple, fast wins. All the data wants is to find a way to get these pieces of data together. You could do that in a day or two. Here you go. That's a huge win. There's, I think there's some really, I'm not saying that data products are easy for the enterprise. I'm not saying that you'll solve it in a day. I am saying that there are, you have the ability to create some quick wins for your business teams. You just focus and listen to what they're asking for. And, and don't think of a big requirements list like we used to do in the waterfall project days. But think about features, right? So for this first set of features for this business team, their MVP, all they want is that table, that cell, and that field put together, and they want it refreshed once a day. Well, how long will it take to do that's that? That's why I love. 
Th that's why I love the Star Wars that Pathfinder, right? That that you introduced yeah. me to Adrian, right? It was it was it really was kind of a spark for me to say, okay, um, you know, th that's what they want, right? It's it's not a bunch of, of hundred consultants mapping domains, then mapping a whole, you know, um, kind of the the value of something like a Pathfinder with kind of what we're doing together, like and you know we worked together with Pathfinder, adding things yeah. like data product canvases. Um, and like, I'm not claiming that Capgemini invented Data Product Canvas, right? It was from a Medium article, right? And it's, it's you know, it's kind of based on product canvases that have come from Strategizer, you know. But it's it's helping. It's it just basically, you know, so with, with Pathfinder, it's kind of helping that it, it's it's basically helping educate the client and saying, okay, let's start small, let's work with the. Think big and design for industrialization. And I know that's a bit of a catchphrase, right? But this yeah. isn't a start from the top. Capgemini consultants, a massive yeah. bill, right? It, it's basically the, the whole concept for me of, uh, of a data product. Uh, and yeah, for me, uh, data mesh principles are. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, let's, let's, we're, we're starting to kind of break into, we said it a couple of times, the customer and the consumer. Let, let's, 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 cross over now and, and talk a bit more uh, specifically about business impact because um, we can talk all day. I think and we haven't talked enough about how we build them and, and the specifics, certainly a lot more to discuss there, but on a one hour show, I want to make sure we do give at least half the time to the business impact. And there's a lot of ways, um, a lot of great examples out there where data products are making an impact in finance, in pharma, in retail, in ESG, you know, there's a lot of great examples. So let me let me pause and let's each we can each kind of share some different ideas. But where do we want to start, um, Andy or Dan or Anthony, do you want to start with one of your examples? I'm happy to toss one in. Sorry, I was just uh, making a quick note into the uh, into the chat for those that don't know what Pathfinder is. Ah, good stuff. Because you stuff. Uh, you referenced it, but I just in case because. Um, he was texting. He was texting his mother, saying he'd be late at uh, home tonight. <laughs> keep, keep the food warm. <laughs> uh, don't give the food to the cat. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. What was the question, Adrian? I, 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 wanna, the... I want to. I want to discuss some real uh, use, kind of real use cases, right? Uh, okay. Examples where data products are making an impact. I know. I'll, I'll, I'll bring one in, right? We supply chain, right? So, whether you're talking about a pharmaceutical supply chain or a back-end retail supply chain or any kind of product supply chain and energy supply chain. Let's talk about pharma. I, I know on the pharmaceutical side, I, in talking to a couple of colleagues and customers and so forth, you know, they've they've used terms like, hey, it's transformed the way that we manage our clinical supply chain. The way that we get our medical products from there to there is very different now. Uh, and they'll talk about examples like in, you know, in the past, in the old days, we used to have this research data that would be put together and we would somebody would say if I take that data and that data and we're talking about oftentimes patient data or testing data or results data if I take this information together and it'll help me figure out um, how to better maybe create a new medical product or how to accelerate a medical product or how to prove that a medical product works and they would create it in a in a lab or in an isolated environment and then somebody else down the hall or across the street or in a different state or a different part of the world that was doing a completely different medical product, they would have to reinvent that. And so just the idea of being able to say, hey, here's something that we've created. I'm going to put that on the shelf and I'm going to call it data product and I'm going to design, describe exactly what it is and I'm going to describe what's in there. Other teams that are also on that same clinical supply chain are able to pick up those data products and say, hey, I could use that for my research. Hey, I could use that for my testing. Hey, I could use that to accelerate my piece. All of a sudden you're sharing data across a broad team, driving more consistency, but also really accelerating the, the way people use data. Because the, the key thing to listen to there is everybody's using the same data, right? Everybody is looking to combine the same data sets and they may have a different purpose for it. But if somebody's already done, done the work and created something that you trust and you can say, hey, if it's working for them, I know it's going to work for me. I trust it. That's a big step forward. And you can take that same example and apply it to finance or energy. And so let me let me step back and see if you guys want to talk about any of your favorite examples. I know, Dan, you in previous conversations, yeah. you had some environmental examples that you wanted to kind of jump into. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it, it's it's no, it's a pain because I'm I'm the person doing the the financial modeling right for 
for funding, right? But it's it's for us to build a sustainability data hub with AWS and with Starburst as key, right? So, um, and for me, like as ESG sustainability, it is a little bit like the Wild West. Okay, um, we see a lot of platforms out there on reporting. There aren't really kind of predefined models, but but. But for me, it was absolutely clear, and I remember like the presentation I did at, at Data Nova, right? I tried to to kind of look at it as a I look at everything as a tree view, right? So there's no point talking about sustainability. So if we give an example of scope one, scope two, and scope three carbon emissions, right? You know, scope one is basically organizing your own house. So if you think, right, that there is a magic piece of technology that will look into your data estate and extract ESG data magically, then you're fooling yourself. The only way, the, the only people who actually know are there certain data points, can they capture them, is through that whole concept of a pizza team delivering a data product. So part of the, you know, part of the, stat, you know, part of, 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 of the SLAs are on the data product. It, it needs to be addressable. You know, it needs to have the security elements. But as we move forward, right, there should be elements, right? So if there is an operational data product where there are data points that are relevant to your ESG goals, they should be sorted, right? So should that, that should be one of the SLAs if you're serious as an organization. And the reason you need to be serious as an organization, especially in Europe, the regulations are coming. And it's what I experienced because I worked in financial services. And a lot of the banks back in the day when GDPR was coming, they left it too late. And then it was complete panic. And then they were paying the penalties. And I'm not sure what it's like in the US, or, or, or but I deal a lot with EMEA clients, right? And reporting at the moment, carbon accounting, right, is done. Yeah. And it's so basic, right? It is an Excel spreadsheet, and with a couple of consultants from Capgemini. And, and that's not Capgemini's fault, right? It's like that, right? You have basically an Excel spreadsheet, right, to do your carbon one emissions. So the only way forward, right? So, 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 so part of the deal is, right, you basically need to organize your data estate. And the future is coming where you need to think about sustainability, right? The two things are, are actually the same thing. Because if you don't have an organized data estate for your business as usual then you, you've got another problem right why not leverage the fact that you are actually working on a strategy to organize through that concept of data products through technologies from aws and from starburst through a system integrator like us who kind of understands that this is really important right then you know it, it, it's going to be very difficult right so the sustainability and what's happening right i think is a a fantastic opportunity. It, it just needs to be done. I mean, we, we, we all understand that, right? Unless you're living under a rock, right? It needs to be done. Data products, data mesh principles, technology companies uh, like you guys, right? Is, um, so, so, so that's kind of my mantra at the moment, right? So, um, so there's a big push internally. I'm building kind of a... Um, I'm, I'm looking at the business use cases, right? But it is, in a way, right? I think everybody is looking at... at what are the business use cases we look at short term, medium term, and long uh, and long term? So carbon accounting, and um, that's kind of the early stage, and that's why Starburst and AWS are the two partners we're using in the architecture that we're proposing. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll be working closer together, guys. Yeah, I love it. Whether you like that or not, you, you, you you'll be dealing with me on a daily basis. I, I gotta get my especially Andy. Ready. Can I expand that a little bit? Um, um, I'm assuming at some point you were going to ask me my uh, for you know my, my the things that I've seen with respect to those products. So um, so Dan mentioned scope one, which is your own house, but then scope two and scope three are really about your downstream suppliers, sorry, your upstream suppliers of energy and your and you know materials and whatever goes into your business, and then and then the the last scope is more focused on kind of consumption of your products and services. Um, and uh, and I was working recently with a 
uh, another a financial services organization who um, basically said that, you know, the traditional approach of trying to come up with a single data model for ESG data and ESG data reporting just didn't work. Um, and the reason for that was purely scale. It, it's not scale of data, it's scale of sources. So, you know, we're typically used to working in organizations where maybe we've got five sources or 10 sources or 20 sources at most of the kind of data. You know, we've got Teradata and an Oracle and a Snowflake and a hadoop thing and, you know, maybe some data in S3 and, and you know, some RDSs and, and you know, whatnot. What um, they were telling you they've got 6,000. Right. So that's quite a change from what we've done historically. There's, um, so... Um, so moving from this idea of 20 data sources into a thing and then to 6,000 data sources into a thing, um, you start to then have to rethink about your kind of process of how you get data from, you know, from source to, to output. And actually, I think uh, kind of to extend what Dan was saying, I think data products as a concept um, is probably going to be the natural kind of way forward uh, with respect to that. Um, and then in terms of just an example, uh, so I've been working with a, uh, an e-commerce uh, company, um, and I wouldn't say that there's a particular data product that I could point to that says, you know, it's changed their lives. But I think what has changed significantly in their organization is the adoption of data products has enabled the lines of business to be a, a lot more agile with respect to data and, and kind of the data that they consume themselves and the data, therefore, they share across all the organization. Um, and actually, I think that started to drive kind of a slightly different culture. Um, so interestingly, by having a different sort of tool set and a different uh, sort of set of responsibilities has changed the culture to be a bit more innovative and a bit more agile with respect to data. Um, and I, I, I just think that's an interesting observation, right? With, with uh, you know, by giving people different tools, they start working in different ways. And then that kind of almost has a, a like a positive feedback. I guess, um, all around data products. Yeah. I, I think, oh. you know, we, with working with big customers, I think, um, somebody would say, great. I heard, you know, uh, big bank X is using data products. Yeah, they are. They're, they're using them everywhere. No, they're not right. You use data products for the parts of the organization that need to use them, right? Where there is a, a need for reusability or a need for consistency in terms of what you're building, so to speak, that you want to build that you create that simplicity, there are other teams in the organization. Uh, you talked about it earlier, Anthony, where you may have an, an AI team. They want raw data, right? They're like, hey, yeah, I love products. Don't be wrong. I would love to use products for my engines, and sometimes I can. But most of the time, I want the raw data. And, and I think that's another thing that we have to consider also is that the, the diversity of the platform that you're building, right? Not just the ability to say, hey, great, I can federate across different systems and build your products, but also the ability to say, hey, I can federate across those systems, just allow you to discover, right? Allow you to find and pull back what you want. Whether you create a product or not, it's, it's completely up to you, but different consumers have different needs. I want to, I want to, I bring that example up because I want to then let's move the conversations. To, I still want to focus on business, but I want to start thinking about the different business requests, right? And let's call data science teams. Or let's consider them a business as well. They're a consumer. And what that does back to you, which I think you brought up earlier, Andy, how we build them. If, if one consumer wants raw data, another consumer wants data products from one source, another consumer wants data products from four sources, and another consumer doesn't know what they want, they wanna just look at what everybody else built, so to speak. You, you sit back and you say, okay, so do I need four platforms? Gosh, it's gonna be really complicated. Can I do it with one platform? Do How do I do it? I, I feel like, what we've tried to do for the recent year or so, maybe the last two years, is maybe we've tried to structure that data in warehouses. Uh, and sometimes that's the right way to do it. I can put it in a warehouse, I can structure it, and they can build their products straight from the warehouse. It's already, it's it's almost ready to go. Um, and that works until you have a lot of, as Andy Light, I love your speech, Andy, around unknowns and unknowns, unknown questions and unknown data. That model works if you know the questions, that model works if you know the data. But when you don't know the questions and you don't know the data, you can't put everything in a warehouse. And so then you've got to go back to a lake. And so I want to talk a bit about the idea. And I'm not saying one is right or wrong. I want to have a conversation about building data products on lake architectures versus building data products. I should say versus or in comparison to building data products in a warehouse architecture and which one might 
provides more advantages for that diverse consumer base. Yep. Who wants to take a stab at that one? Um, I'm happy to go with that, Adrian, because uh, only because, you know, um, I'm a recovering data engineer myself uh, <laughs> in my past life. Um, the first so thing to, is admitting it. That's the first step. <laughs> that is the first step. Uh, you know, I think what I will say is, again, from my personal experience, I've worked with pharmaceutical firms in the past, you know, during my consulting days, and uh, I've worked in the supply chain um, line at Amazon as well. And I think one of the key factors was, uh, as you mentioned, Adrian, earlier, it's the persona, right? There's different business persona. When you talk about business, there is a set of persona who just want data with the snap of a finger, right? But we all know on this call that it doesn't work that way, right? Like you said, it could be one data source, it could be 20, it could be thousands of data sources, right? And then as a data engineer, you got to tie it back to the business SLA, right? For example, if it's a pharmaceutical firm, we're talking about clinical trial data, right? We're talking about patient data. This is super critical to get yeah. to the end user, right? So that they can take actions based on the data that they have, right? So that's one use case. You talk about supply chain. If I'm placing an order, let's say on a retail website, I want to know that my product is going to be shipped to me within two days, right? I don't know if it's going to be in stock or not. So these are things that as a data engineer, I can build separate data products, right? To streamline my workflow, or I could put it in one place. So it's up to the end user. I've seen companies move from thousand on-prem databases to one massive data warehouse, and it's worked perfectly for them, right? And I've also seen customers say, hey, we don't want to restrict or put data in one database or one data warehouse, because you know what? We have an AI ML use case, like you said, like we touched upon earlier, I want data sitting in a data lake, right? So that makes it easier for my data scientist to pull data, run my tests and put it back. And then the end user can visualize it in a tool. It could be a BI analytics tool or whatnot, right? It could be a graph as well. So I think it's, it's important to study the persona. It's important to study the individual use cases. And I'm a huge fan of avoiding tech debt, right? I'm not gonna go back mine five years of data and then somehow the business says, oh, you know, guess what? We forgot one column. No, it doesn't work that way. I'm gonna pull the entire thing and then I'm gonna break it down into individual data products and then say, hey, now you pick what you want. So that way you don't have to go again and pull the data from all those data sources or you don't have to put it again. So it's a one-time work. And that's the way I like to simplify uh, stuff. I love it. Simplification, leverage what you have. You know, if, if it's already in a warehouse, we're not saying move it back to a lake. Let's leverage the warehouse. Uh, if you haven't already moved to a warehouse, let's take a step back and think about how you maximize that lake. Because I love the agility and the flexibility that I get from my lake. You know, and the idea of building kind of a virtual warehouse on top of that lake seems a lot faster and a lot cheaper and a lot more sustainable than, than a, a different approach. But again, Somebody would say, so let's all go do that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's figure out what you have, right? Let's figure out what you have, figure out what you need, and then we can figure out the right way to get there. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, um, I always like to just say, hey, be neutral on, on topics, but I, I feel like I'm getting bolder on that position uh, where I, more and more I feel like I'm saying, yeah, this, is, this is the way to do it. I appreciate that we can't all get there overnight, but I think that's the right way to do it. Let me see if Andy or, or Dan have any other thoughts on that, on those points. Uh, someone someone in the chat has asked, isn't it about interoperability? Yeah. I'm just going to throw that out there before. Yeah, yeah. I try, it, it, you know, sorry. I think right, if we, um, it's, and sorry, Andy, right? <laughs> but uh, I'm a guest, right? So That's right, Andy, come on. So you get to, yeah. you, you'll get priority over me, thanks. Well, yeah, I basically <laughs> I get to show it over you, basically. Um, no, but what, what's, um, you know, because we're kind of, you know, we're chew as we say, we're chewing the cud here, right? What, what I love, um, you know, so the, the whole data products thing, right? I, I looked back a little bit into the history, right? Because um, I only arrived to data about four and a half, five years ago. Okay. And the kind of the first question for me, I was always curious as to why it was, there was always an ingest part. Why, why there was a medallion architecture, right? Where you had to ingest, transform, right? And because I came from an application space and, you know, I was an application developer, right? And I worked for IBM for years and we had these huge monolithic um, 
Java enterprise application servers, right? And when I worked for the FS part of Capgemini, a lot of our work was, was kind of doing application migration. So you could have an application with a million lines of code. How did you actually migrate that, right? And it's no coincidence, right, that the company that Zamak Degani worked for, right, um, the guy who, who founded it was Martin Fowler, the godfather of microservices, right? And I think data mess maybe arrived a little bit earlier than the actual technology because anytime you have a mess, right? So, so, so if we talk about, let's say, microservices, one of the nightmares for microservices, and this is kind of what we call the Netflix model. So imagine you have, you've taken your monolithic application, you've broken it down into a set of microservices with pizza, with pizza teams who are doing the, the build, the test, and the actual run and operations of that, right? So for example, at Amazon, if at three o'clock in the morning, the, the actual, the, the, the checkout cart is down, there, there's a microservice around that, right? You're getting a call. You're part of the dev team, right? So we're, we're trying to actually, in a way, like data mesh is trying to move to that way of looking at data, which we, we weren't before. And but data mesh principles were kind of there, and then we all wanted to jump on the whole data mesh thing because it actually makes sense to have pizza sized teams who had domain experts kind of delivering on it. But the technology really wasn't there because a lot of our architectures were, are still medallion. And, and the problem with a mesh is, right? So if you have microservices, they have a contract, an API, a REST based API, but the actual data, the functionality is within that little microservice. With a mesh, right? And if the principles of a mesh are, right, that you're, but if you're replicating data, that's a problem because how do you do that synchronization? And that's why I was very interested when I saw Starburst, but the, there was a hangover because with Starburst, Trino, there is that, it's data versus a problem with performance. So, I, I eventually worked my head out and said, right, okay, there isn't a problem with the performance, but the, the, the fact that they can leave the data, the raw data where it is, right, is actually what you, you do in a mesh, which would could either be a microservice mesh when we're doing applications to data. And I think it's a challenging journey, right? Because it took, it took us 10 years, it, it took us 10 years in the application space to move from monolithic, Java applications running on big Java application servers. We had design patterns called strangling the monolith when you wanted to move from an IBM mainframe, et cetera. And I think we're going through that journey, okay? And in applications, we were, we were more advanced with the way we do, did the CI, CD stuff. Um, and I think we're, we're going through that journey, right? Um, strangling the monolith. Like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was called that, right? Because I remember I worked on a project, right, where we we were introducing microservices, but we had an IBM mainframe. So, and we used methodologies. There was a there's a methodology called event storming. How you actually define what that pizza sized piece of business functionality is, and then how you could kind of use APIs to still be part of it, right? So you still had to keep the lights on with the mainframe, et cetera. And I think we're kind of going, to, we're going through that, right? Um, and this is why it's an exciting journey to work with AWS and, and with Starburst to kind of, to bring in kind of those ideas because I'm an old man, right? I'm, you know, I'm 57, uh, but I, I've been through these journeys before. <laughs> I've been through these journeys before. Um, and I think it's it's a really exciting journey. But if you're physically replic if you're physically bringing the data in doing the, the ingest, then it becomes difficult. The synchronization becomes a problem, right? So, um, so oh, and, and that's why I think, yeah, that, that that Starburst have a very interesting solution. Yeah, I, I want to um, talk a little bit about, and just for a second, because I see there's a question on the chat with regards to the marketplace. Awesome question. We have to talk about that. But real quick, on just to underscore something you said about domains, I um when I started preaching or whatever the word is, data mesh, um, I was very disciplined about the idea of domains because I felt that to me that was the idea of a domain team working autonomously using self-service tools to drive their own car with speed. 
uh, you know, where I had seen that happen, it was fantastic. And I was like, that's what everybody should be doing. If you're building products without that domain framework, it's just IT maybe working more efficiently, but not getting the full benefit. I've changed my mind. And not to say I still love domains. I think still think it's the right way to go. But I see more and more companies just going right to data products. Data products are much easier to, to start with. And I feel like they're starting with data products and then they're organically moving to a point where the teams that are using data products, some of them start to raise their hand and say, hey, I, I want to do more. And then you start to build domains around those teams. I think that is what I see starting to see more and more often is kind of people just start with data products and then work into domains when the teams are ready. And I think that's okay. I think that works. I just hopefully more and more of us get to those. 100% agree. 100% agree. Yeah. You, you've nailed it on the head, right? Because I, I started the same as well. I tried to map all of the domains. I think it's easier to work bottom up on, on this. Yeah. Define what the, the business value is. At, at, and then you can actually virtually map it to a domain. Right? Because it becomes kind of a lot easier. Because let's say business domains in, in different countries are different. Right, you, you can't have a generic definition of what a business domain is. Which is the way we tried to do it at Capgemini at the start. Right? And and it didn't work, you know. Be yeah. Well, let me let's let's get to marketplace. Uh, and not not to to rush anybody. I want you want to make sure because I think it's a great question. There, there's a lot of different. Well, gosh, another one of those words with a lot of different definitions. I, I do think, just like we're seeing, I, I said at the beginning of the of the conversation, I see fabrics and mesh and virtualization layer and semantic layer strategies, and when I look at, under the covers, they all look the same, right? They're all using data products. They're all and so. More and more, I think we're starting, at least from a design perspective, we're starting to come to a design, no matter what you call it, it's the same, it's the same core capabilities. Hopefully from a marketplace perspective, because I was in a CDO conversation a year ago where everyone in the room, there must have been 16 CDOs, had a different vision or perspective for what a marketplace was. And somebody was saying, it's where I go to sell and monetize my data products. And somebody else was saying, no, it's a common enterprise catalog where people come to pull data products. And somebody else, everybody had a different idea for it. Um, let's let's. I'd love to hear your thoughts on on what marketplace is. And so, Anthony, if you don't mind, can I can I start with you? Absolutely. You know, and uh, I'll go back to just to simplify it for everyone. Um, you know, in the audience, I'll go back to the Amazon shopping experience. Right. Uh, think of AWS Marketplace as a B two B portal right, where a customer can shop for third-party software, right? And what that means is it's not just, you know, just buying it, but it's also simplifying the deployment with a click of a button, right? So if you're a customer and you want to, let's say, leverage Starburst on AWS Marketplace, you have the option to seamlessly deploy your infrastructure in your account without having to worry about setting up everything from scratch. So we're simplifying the process from weeks, months, right, to a few seconds and a few minutes, right? And also what it does is it helps manage your licensing and billing in one place, right? Let's say you want to use your free trial for your software and you want to have purchase options. They're all listed in one console. So think of it as a unified experience to buy software. And we can go one step further, Adrian. We have something known as data exchange that allows you to buy data files, data products, even data APIs, like Dan was saying, right? So you can actually buy them from one stop shop. And that's what the AWS Marketplace experience is all about. Data as a service, love it, love it, love it, love it. Andy, do you have a different view for Marketplace? Uh, similar, I guess. I think um, for me, Data Marketplace becomes useful when you cross an organizational boundary, whether that's an internal organizational boundary or an external. Um, that and and then the marketplace is a place that you as a producer make your product uh, visible, discoverable, um, and kind of addressable, I guess. Um, and then I think the, the kind of the payment or otherwise, yeah, the, the, there's many things I think we need to think about when it comes to payment. I mean, in the AWS model, obviously people are buying something in the in an internal marketplace let's say where i'm sharing my data with another function maybe there isn't a payment right but there's potentially there's a, a cost of consumption right and and i think the marketplace is a, a sort of a i don't know barrier is the wrong word but but a boundary if you like between 
um, between me as the producer and you as the consumer. Uh, and we need to think about when you consume my thing, are you consuming my thing on my infrastructure or are you consuming your my thing on your infrastructure? And kind of who pays for that and how that all gets managed. And I think that is part of a marketplace as well, right? That agreement that you're going to use my thing um, and I'm going to supply it to you with the compute and everything else, or you're going to use my thing, but you're going to supply the compute or, or, or and how that all works. That to me is part of the marketplace as well as the, you know, the things I've just kind of described around sort of discovering things and addressing them, etc. Awesome. Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, uh, it was me who told you about this concept. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, the, no, the reason I'm laughing is right because when I was so when I was uh, when I was preparing kind of the, the talk at Data Nova, right? I actually came up with a big challenging question for myself, right? Because um, data mesh, data products, they work really, really well within an, an organization. So then I was thinking it was the ESG topic, right? And I was looking at scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, right? So scope one was easy. It was in your organization. You could organize those little uh, data points within a kind of a tree view related ESG data products through a region, right? And then I said, right, okay, because we partner all, we partner at Capgemini with Informatica, right? And they have an excellent marketplace, right? But, but then to, to Andy's point, right? Who pays for that? So then I was looking at, right, so how do you, for scope two, scope three, where you, have, scope two would be your electricity supplier, your cloud service provider, and then scope so, scope two, sorry, and scope three then would be making a mobile phone, the trucks that are bringing the lithium, right, to, to, to build your, the batteries, et cetera, right? How do you manage that, right? So how do you have a decentralized, right? So... I, I stumbled at a thing called um, Ocean Marketplace. And Ocean Marketplace is kind of based on Bitcoin. Um, and I introduced it to, blockchain. To, to my bosses. Yeah, blockchain, basically. Blockchain, right? not Bitcoin. So, uh, yeah, uh, blockchain. It, it uses uh, Ethereum, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? So, But I did introduce it, right? And, the, and you know, the, the, the powers that be at Captain are going, whoa, well, it, it, that's a little bit too much, right? But it does raise a good question. How you on ramp, and I know I've been speaking with the product teams at, at Starburst. How you on on ramp from your own organization, where you will organize through data products. What I think needs to be a decentralized way to look at marketplaces, because in the end, if you have your suppliers, who actually pays for and who owns this, how can you actually convince your suppliers? to use your marketplace that's actually in your AWS um, subscription, right? May be something difficult. And with things like ESG, ESG, you, you, you will need marketplaces to share that data. Um, and you will need kind of the trust, you know, the, the way trust is done uh, via blockchain, right? So, so it's um, a very interesting, and I know we're out of time, right? But um, maybe wow. for the next conversation, guys, yeah. we can kind of go more into marketplaces. Yeah, I, I want to summarize it a little bit. Uh, you guys are all way too smart and your brains are way too big. I think uh, when you think about marketplace, I think everything you've described is, to me, it feels very futuristic. And I'm not saying that that isn't happening today. And I'm not saying that's where we're going. I agree that's where we're going. And I do see some big marketplaces like what you described, Anthony, and Amazon already available today. I love the idea of data as a service. That, I'm not going to quote you exactly, but the way you drew that idea of clicking on something and then being able to immediately deploy it. It's, you know, I remember the first time we started buying cloud services and we went to order a server and it just came up. It, it used to take us two months to bring a server up on-prem and all of a sudden it was happening in, in minutes right in front of us. That's, that's You would use an EC2 instance Boom. and install its software. It would take, it would take forever. You know, the younger engineers today yeah. don't understand the way we used to do it, right? And, and that's the transformation I think we're going to, we should see with data as a service and, and data products. But MVP for marketplace, right? I think right now, just internally, I think the what maybe most companies are starting to build right now is I want you, you want to think of a single place, call it a catalog, call it an enterprise internal marketplace where any of your consumers can go to one stop shop and they're able to see all the data products that are available. Look, I would love for all your data products to come from Starburst. I think we can build great data products. You know what the reality is? They're going to have data products from Starburst. They're going to have data products from Redshift. They're going to have data products from other sources. That's okay, right? You want to optimize 
the right data products using the best tools for the best use case, from a consumer perspective, they don't care, right? There should be some consistency in how you build data products and they should be able to go to that marketplace. And I'm not saying that means they're buying them. It means they're able to quickly find what they're looking for and quickly, as you described, click it and use it, so to speak. That to me is the, is the MVP and maybe MVP is maybe a little, maybe I'm being a bit ambitious here, but I think that's the first step. If you can get that going, then you can start to think about how to let external parties come in and maybe purchase data products or share data products. But doing that internally is a huge win already. I know we are a, a minute over, but I wanted to thank uh, Anthony. I want to thank Dan and Andy, my friend, for just a really, really great conversation. We covered a lot and we never cover enough because this, these are topics that we're all very passionate about. But listening to you talk about it, bring your intelligence, bring your experience. I think uh, hopefully the audience uh, appreciates that. I certainly do from my side. So thank you very much. And this is the last episode. I'll pause for a second to see if there's any closing thoughts from Anthony, Dan, or Andy. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say, uh, Dan, uh, you know, when you talked about, you know, IBM mainframes, I started my career uh, way back, you know, working on IBM mainframes and AS400s. And here we are still talking about hey, You're too young. No. <laughs> no, no, Where did I go wrong? No, 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 you're, you're, lying, you're lying to me, Anthony. You're too young, man. You're too young no, and good no, looking. No way, man. That, that's it's the, all I, competition. It's a compliment. <laughs> but that's the point I'm trying to make. I think we love Fantastic. working with partners like Capgemini and Starburst to help shape the modern architecture, even though they're coming from in the mainframe world, right? I think that's the journey. Uh, and it's just phenomenal to see how we've uh, evolved so far and continue to evolve. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. A Andy, you're... Yeah, brilliant. Uh, no, no, I'm, I think everyone has uh, said everything they need to say. I'm not going to say any more because A, we're over time, and B, we'll no, get into our whole age yeah. thing again. So. Yeah, and, th and thank you so much, Ruth. I love working with you guys, Ruth. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's always, it's great fun, Ruth. Um, and, and a bit of fun sometimes helps, Ruth. Because, Absolutely. No, and thank you so much for, for inviting us. And, and thank you, Anthony, as well, Ruth. It's yeah, fantastic stuff. Okay. We can all, we can all uh, close we'll speak soon, yeah? On the Dan point. All right. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>